Book 4, Chapter 2, Part 3 of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daryl Edson. The History of the Spanish Inquisition, Volume 2, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 4, Chapter 2, Part 3. The History of the Spanish Inquisition, Volume 2, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 4, Organization. Chapter 2, Part 3, The Tribunal. That there was a gross neglect of duty follows as a matter of course. The hours prescribed for work, during which all were required to be present, were only six, three in the morning and three in the afternoon, except on the numerous holidays, and visitors in their inspections were instructed to inquire especially into this. From such reports of visitations as I have examined, it would appear that the enforcement of the rule was difficult. Cervantes, indeed, in his report on Barcelona in 1561, says that there is no hope of securing regular attendance unless the Suprema will impose a penalty for default of more than one hour. Absence from the post of duty was an abuse which also seemed incurable. Even under the vigilant rule of Ferdinand, a circular letter of the Suprema, September 7, 1509, calls attention to the absence of the officials on their private business, the inquisitors, in urgent cases, could grant leave of absence for twenty days in the year, but this was never to be exceeded. Records were to be kept, and salaries were to be proportionately docked. This was perfectly ineffectual. In 1520, we find the Suprema writing to the officials of Barcelona to return to their posts within ten days, and rebuking the inquisitors for permitting this neglect of duty, but a repetition of the letter in 1521 shows how fruitless had been the first one. The trouble was by no means confined to Barcelona, and in 1521 Cardinal Adrian made an effort to check it by declaring vacant the office of anyone absenting himself for two months. It was not only the subordinates, for the inquisitors themselves had frequently to be taken to task for similar neglect of duty. The trouble was endless, and serves in part to explain the cruel delays which aggravated so greatly the sufferings of those under the trial. In 1573, the rule of 1509 was repeated, with the addition that, if the twenty days granted were exceeded by ten days, the absentee was not to be admitted to his office on his return, and this again was reissued in 1597, together with an order that no inquisitor should absent himself without permission from the Suprema. This was not the only matter in which inquisitors had to be kept in check. The frequent commands for them to not accept commissions to attend to outside business show how eager were people to secure the services of agents so powerful and how ready were the inquisitors thus to sell their influence. So when Valdes in 1560 ordered them not to ask for favors, for complaints were made by people that they were forced to grant what was asked. We recognize how infinite were the resources of petty tyranny afforded by the terror which they inspired. That they were not superior to the vices of the period may be inferred from an injunction by Valdes in 1566 to exercise great moderation in gambling. Earnest efforts were not lacking to maintain a fair standard of efficiency and discipline in the tribunals, although they were largely neutralized by the restricted authority allowed to the inquisitors and the fatal clemencies shown to delinquents. Isabella has the credit of reforming the administration of justice in Castile by periodically sending inspectors, incorruptible and inflexible, to scrutinize the operation of the courts, and it was not long after the organization of the Inquisition that a similar plan was found necessary for its tribunals. We happen to hear of a visitador, or inspector, at Medina del Campo, while Torquemada was still in active exercise of his functions, probably before 1490. From letters of 1497, we learn that the salaries of an inspector and his notary were the same as those of an inquisitor and notary. 
a hundred thousand Maravedis for the one and forty thousand for the other. These were appointed by the Inquisitor General and carried royal letters ordering inquisitors to receive and treat them well and all officials to aid them, give them free passage, and levy no tolls, dues, ferriages, or fees of any kind. The instructions of 1498 create permanent inspectors general, of whom there were to be one or two to visit all tribunals and report their condition. They were not to lodge or eat with the inquisitors or to receive presents from them and were to exercise only the powers expressed in their commissions. Under this, Francisco de Simancas, Archdeacon of Cordova, was appointed inspector with Gonzalo's Masons as his notary. How long he served does not appear, but orders for the payment of his salary can be traced until 1503. When the inquisitions of Castile and Aragon were separated in 1507, each continued to employ inspectors. Alonso Rodriguez, of whom we hear in 1509, probably belonged to Castile. In 1514, Jimenez appointed Juan Morris as inspector, after which special inspectors ceased for a time to be employed, for in 1517, the Inquisitor of Cordova was sent to inspect Toledo, Seville, and Yeen, and the Inquisitor of Yeen inspect Cordova, Suencia, and Valladolid. In Aragon, Mercator in 1513 sent Juan de Arolia to inspect Morocca, Sardina, and Sicily, and about the same time, Hernando de Montemayor to inspect the tribunals of Aragon, Catalonia, and Valencia. After the reunion of the Inquisition, Cardinal Adrian introduced an innovation by pointing laymen to the office, licentates Sisa and Piena, the former, a judge in the High Court of Valladolid. Their functions were enlarged, for Charles V describes them as persons of high authority, not connected with the Inquisition, sent to investigate all the tribunals, and to reform whatever required amendment, for which he clothed them with ample powers. These regular routine inspections came to an end, and though the wholesome supervision was not abandoned, it became irregular, either employed occasionally or when complaints seemed to indicate its necessity. Barcelona was a troublesome tribunal, but it seems to have been visited only at intervals from six to ten years. The inspections were not inexpensive, and the cost had to be defrayed by the Suprema. When in 1567, de Soto Salazar, a member of the Suprema, was sent to investigate Valencia, Barcelona, and Sagrosia, he was given at the outset 400 ducats, and his secretary, Pablo Garcia, 200. The rule became established to employ only inquisitors and those in active service, not retired. The work, when conscientiously performed, was not light. An inspection of the Canary Tribunal, made by Claudio de la Cueva, lasted from 1595 to 1597, and his report forms a mass of 1,124 folios. This was unusually laborious, but reports covering three, four, or five hundred pages are not uncommon. The visitador was expected to make a thorough investigation of the condition and working of the tribunal, to discover all neglect of regulations, all abuses, and malefeasance of the officials, all derelictions of duty, all maladministrations of the property and revenues, all misuse of power, whether through oppression of the defenseless or reminiscence of vindicating the faithful. He was to examine the records, not only to see that they were properly kept and indexed, but also whether justice had been duly administered and the estilio of the Holy Office had been rigidly followed. He visited the prisons, listened to the complaints of the prisoners, and investigated them. On arrival, he fixed a day on which he would appear in the audience chamber. The inquisitors and all officials were assembled. His credentials were read, and the inquisitors promised obedience in the name of all present. The next day, the inquisitors were examined under oath as to whether there was anything requiring amendment and whether the officials performed their full duty the answers being taken down in writing. The inspector brought with him an elaborate series of interrogatories, usually 48 or 50 in number, covering all the points which experience had shown as likely to tempt to wrongdoing, and on these he examined all the officials singly. He also listened to all who had complaints to make. 
If these appeared to be justified, he investigated them thoroughly, summoning all witnesses who were guaranteed that their names would be kept secret. And on this evidence, he framed charges against those inculpated and heard them in defense. When his duties in the tribunal were accomplished, he was expected to visit the district and investigate all the complaints. The results were reduced to writing, and when his labors were complete, he sent or carried the whole to the Suprema for its action. As a rule, he had no executive authority and could only make recommendations, but visitors to the colonies were frequently invested with greater power, presumably in view of the long delays in communication. When in 1654 Medina Rico came as inspector to Mexico, where maladministration was flagrant, he sat in judgment on the inquisitors Estrada and Huguera, suspended them, and occupied the tribunal for years. It can be readily conceived that at times there was no little friction between the inspector and inquisitors, and in 1645 the Suprema presented for the king a consulta on the controversies thence arising. The necessities for these visitations diminished in proportion as the tribunals were subordinated to the Suprema. When they had to make monthly reports of all pending cases, so that their action was under constant supervision, when all sentences were submitted for confirmation or revision, the papers showing the conduct of the cases, when no arrest could be made without presenting the Sumera and receiving authority, when, moreover, the business arrangements of property was scrutinized through monthly reports of the Wanta de Hacienda, there was no longer a justification for the expenses of visitations. The growing facilities of intercommunication encouraged centralization and enabled the Suprema to maintain a constant supervision. When, therefore, it concentrated in itself all of the judicial facilities of the Inquisition, rendering the tribunals merely instruments for investigation, the functions of the visitors became superfluous, at least in the peninsula. The palace or building, which was the seat of the tribunal, was divided into the secreto and the outside rooms or apartments. It was expected to furnish lodgings for the inquisitors and, if spacious enough, for the other officials. The most important feature was the carcelius secretus, or the secret prison for those on trial, for it was necessary that they could be brought at any moment to the audience chamber without being seen by anyone. There was, of course, a torture chamber, which seems to have generally been underground. The secreto, originally, was merely a record room in which the papers and documents were preserved. From the first, these were guarded with jealous secrecy, not only on account of their importance in the trials, but because their abstractions or destruction was so ardently desired by the kindred or accomplices of the convicts. As early as 1485, Ferdinand, in his instructions to the tribunal of Saragossa, orders that no servant of any of the officials shall enter lo secreto de la Inquisición. The instructions of 1498 provide that the chest or chambers in which the papers are kept shall have three keys, two held by the notarios del secretos and one by the fiscal, so that no one can take out a document save in the presence of others, and no one shall enter it except the inquisitors, the notaries, and the fiscal, rules substantially repeated in the Sicilian instructions of 1560. Among the derelictions of the Barcelona Tribunal reported in 1561 by Cervantes was the neglect of this rule leading, he said, to grave abuses. The functions and extent of the secreto were gradually enlarged. In Mercator's instructions of 1514, the money chest with three keys was ordered to be kept in the secreto, a provision which became permanent. When the rule was established of conducting the trials in profound secrecy, a veil of impenetrable mystery was thrown around all the operations of the Inquisition. The audience chamber was included in the secreto, as well as the offices occupied by the fiscal and secretaries. The door was secured by three locks having different keys, and entrance was forbidden save to those officially privileged or summoned. In 1645, it was discovered that there was a clangor in the notaries or secretaries bringing in their swords, for a prisoner, when led to an audience, might in his desperation seize one and give trouble, and they were consequently ordered in future to be left outside. In the Valencia Tribunal, there was considerable excitement in 1679, when the pages of the inquisitors got possession of the keys and had false ones made, which they gained at will access to the sacred precincts, but no harm seems to have arisen from the boyish prank. One feature of the audience chamber was significant, 
a solosia or lattice behind which a witness could identify a prisoner without being seen or recognized. In considering the personnel of the tribunal, we may dismiss the assessor with a few words. Such an official was unknown in the old Inquisition, but we have seen that when the first inquisitors were sent to Seville, they were accompanied by an assessor, and such a functionary continued some time to be considered a necessary adjunct to the tribunal. At the beginning, the inquisitors were Dominican friars, presumably good theologians, but unversed in the intricacies of law. It was therefore desirable to associate them with a lawyer as a guide, and his presence, moreover, might serve as an assurance to the people of the legality of the proceedings. In Torquemada's instructions of 1485, it is provided that they must always act in concert, and that anything done by one without the other was invalid. Even communications to the Suprema must be signed by both. In the trials of this period, we sometimes find the assessor sitting with the inquisitors, and sometimes not, and the sentences are rendered by the latter with the concurrence of the former. In the secular law of the period, the assessor had only a consultive and not a decisive role. This would appear to be his position in the tribunal, when the routine of the Inquisition had established its own precedence, when all doubtful questions were decided by the Suprema, and the services of trained lawyers were no longer required. In the early time, their salaries were the same as the Inquisitor's. Indeed, at Saragossa in 1486, Martin Martinez, the assessor, receives 5,000 saludos, while the inquisitors are rated at 4,000. It was not long, however, before it apparently became indifferent whether there was an assessor or not. In 1499, the salary lists of Seville, of Burgos, and of Valencia have no mention of such an official. While there is one at Saragossa, and in 1500, Ferdinand empowers the inquisitor of Sardinia to select for his assessor any doctor he pleases. The office continued to exist for a time as a kind of supernumerary employed in hearing the civil cases of officials, but in the Argosis Concordia of 1568, this duty was placed on the inquisitors and the assessorship was abolished. In Castile, the list of officials promulgated in the same year by Philip II is entitled to exemption from taxation and makes no mention of the assessor who may be assumed by this time to disappear. The inquisitors, of course, were the superior officials of the tribunal. They were the judges, with practically unlimited power over the lives and fortunes and honor of all whom they summoned before them until they were gradually restricted by the growing centralization of the Suprema. To the people, they were the incarnation of the dreaded holy office, regarded with more fear and veneration than a bishop or noble, for all the powers of state and church were placed at their disposal. They could arrest and imprison at will. With their excommunication, they could, at a word, paralyze the arm of all secular officials and, with their interdict, plunge whole communities into despair. Such a concentration of secular and spiritual authority, guarded by so little limitation and responsibility, has never, under any other system, been entrusted to fallible human nature. To exercise it wisely and temperamentally called for exceptional elevation of character, self-control, and mature experience of men and things. That friars, suddenly called from the cloister or the schools and clothed with such limitless power over their fellow beings, should sometimes grow intoxicated with their position and commit the awful slaughter which marked the early years of the Inquisition gives no occasion for surprise. Nor that their successors should have trampled with such arrogant audacity on all who ventured to raise a voice against their misuse of their prerogatives. It is therefore worth our while to examine what qualifications were required by popes and kings in those whom they selected as fitted for an office of such bewildering temptations and such vast opportunities for evil. Sextus the Fourth, in the Bull of November first, fourteen seventy eight, empowered Ferdinand and Isabella to appoint as inquisitors three bishops or other worldly men, priests, either regular or secular, over forty years of age, God-fearing, of good character and record, masters or bachelors of theology or licentates of canon law. The prescription as to the minimum age was as old as the Council of Vinny in 1312 and had become a matter of course. The rest was as well chosen a definition of the requisite qualities as perhaps could be expressed in general terms, considering the temper of age and the work to be performed. 
So in 1483, when Sixtus, under the influence of Cardinal Borgia, desired to get rid of Inquisitor Golbis, he asked Ferdinand to replace him with some master of theology who had the fear of God and was eminent for his virtues. The only inquisitors that Spain had known were Dominicans, and although they were not specified, it seemed to be a matter of course that the Inquisition should remain in their hands. But Ferdinand, in his struggle with Sixtus for the control of the Aragonese Inquisition, had encountered the obstacle of obedience due by the friars to their general, who, of course, was a creature of the Curia. He was resolved to organize the Inquisition to suit himself, which explains why Torquemada, in his instructions of December 6, 1484, simplified the formula of qualifications to letrados, either lawyers or men of university training, of good repute and consequence, the fittest that could be had. This did not even require the inquisitor to be an ecclesiastic, except, insofar, as there were comparatively few letardos of this time who were not in orders. When Innocent VIII renewed the commission of Torquemada, February 3, 1485, it empowered him to appoint, as inquisitors, fitting ecclesiastics, learned and God-fearing, provided they were masters of theology, or doctors, or licentates of law, or cathedral canons, or holding other church dignities. But while this was repeated in a subsequent bull of March 24, 1486, it was simplified in another clause into ecclesiastics of proper character and learning not less than 30 years of age. This reduction in the age limit was retained by Alexander VI in the commissions issued to Diza, November 24, 1498, and September 1, 1499. When the requisite of being an ecclesiastic was omitted, for the qualification was reduced simply to suitable men of good and tender conscience, even if they had not reached 40 years of age, but are more than 30. This became virtually the accepted formula as shown in the commissions issued June 4th and 5th, 1507 by Julius II to Ingeria for Argonia and to Ximenes for Castile and in those of Leo X to Mercator and Pole in 1513 and to Cardinal Adrian in 1516 and 1518. The office of the Inquisitor was thus thrown open to the laity and there was no hesitation in employing them so long as they remained single. But if they married, they were obliged to resign, possibly because it was thought impossible for a married man to preserve the absolute secrecy regarded as essential in the holy office. Licentate Aguirre, Ferdinand's favorite member of the Suprema, was a layman. On June 28, 1515, Ferdinand writes to Yemenes that the Licentate Nebridia, Inquisitor of Seville, desires to marry, and he is a good servant. Another office has been found for him, while the treasurer for the Church of Pampolonia will make a suitable appointee for Seville. Two other similar cases occurred about the same time. It was an anomaly to allow laymen to sit in judgment of matters of faith, but no action was taken to prevent it until Philip II, in his instructions of 1595 to the Marquis de Lora, ordered that the inquisitors and fiscals at least must be in holy orders, a clause omitted by Philip III in his instructions of 1608. At length the Suprema met the question. November 10, 1632, by requiring all inquisitors to have themselves ordained and prohibiting them otherwise from exercising their functions, a provision which apparently met with slack obedience, for it had to be repeated January 12th and June 5th of 1637, with the addition that inquisitors and fiscals who were not in orders should receive no salaries. Even this does not seem to have been effective, for in 1643 a consulta called attention to the matter as a great evil and indecency, and suggested that a papal brief should be obtained, rendering priest's order an essential qualification for inquisitors and fiscals. This was not done, but we may presume that in time the functions were confined to ecclesiastics. Legal training was prescribed as a requisite in 1608 by Philip III, who ordered that no one should be appointed inquisitor or fiscal who could not exhibit to the Suprema his diplomacy of graduation in law. Carlos II repeated this in 1695, adding that inquisitors and secretaries must not be natives of the provinces to which they are assigned, so as to avert partisanship, so that the strictest investigation into character and lapisia must precede appointment. 
The papal requirements, expressed in the successive commissions issued to the inquisitors general, continued for a while to be simply that they should appoint prudent and suitable men of good repute and sound conscience who had attained the age of thirty years. Apparently this violation of the Clementine rule of forty years led to some animadversion, and in the commission of Valadis in 1547 there is no allusion to age. This example was followed until 1596. Clement VIII, in commission to Porticario, inserted a minimum age limit of forty years as required by the canons, adding that if enough suitable men of that age could not be found, as to which he charged Porticario's conscience, then men of thirty-five could be appointed. But if this were done without necessity, the appointment would be invalid. To this, Porticaro objected, saying that it rendered it impossible for him to make appointments without scruples of conscience, as it was difficult to find suitable persons of the designated age to take the office. And he therefore begged that the limit should be reduced to thirty years, as had been done by all popes since Innocent VIII. Clement yielded, but was careful to insert a derogation of the apostolic constitution, and especially of the Clementine Dolentis. Thenceforth to the end, all limitation of age was discreetly omitted, the formula being simply prudent and suitable men, of good repute and sound conscience, and zealous for the Catholic faith. Yet the minimum wage was understood to be thirty, and when younger men were appointed, dispensations were required. As in 1782, Inquisitor General Bertinan gave the inquisitorship of Barcelona to Don Mitas Bertinan. Apparently, objection was made to his youth, and in 1783, a papal dispensation was procured, empowering him to exercise the office in spite of not having attained the age of 30. The patronage of the inquisitors was greatly limited by the gradual centralization of powers in the Suprema. In the early period, they had the appointment of the porteros and the nonicos, operators and messengers, and when, in 1500, Fernand reorganized the Sicilian tribunal, he sent inquisitors with power to fill all offices except that of receiver. In 1502, he even authorized the inquisitor of Lerida and Husca to appoint a judge of confiscations and notary at each place. Subsequently, as we have seen, the inquisitor general absorbed all the patronage of salaried offices, even to the porteros and nonicos. If a vacancy occurred in a post which the daily duties were essential, the inquisitors could fill it temporarily, while reporting it at once to the Suprema and waiting its orders, but they had no other power. As regards the numerous unsalaried officials, the inquisitor general appointed the consultores and the calificadores, or censors, and also the commissioners for cathedral towns, seaports, and cities, which were seats of the tribunal. This left to the inquisitors the only appointment of familiars and commissioners in other places, though at first, in cathedral towns, they might select a canon of the cathedral for commissioner. It was the same with regards to expenditures, as to which originally they enjoyed a certain freedom of action. This, as has been shown above, was curtailed until ultimately the Suprema controlled even the smallest outlays. It also kept watch over the morals of the inquisitors, recognizing the temptations to which they were exposed and the opportunities afforded by their position. Among the interrogatories which the inspector was instructed to make was whether the inquisitors lived decently without publicly keeping concubines or corrupting the female prisoners or the wives and daughters of prisoners or of the dead whose fame and memory were prosecuted. When attention was called to official misconduct, it was promptly looked into. As in 1528, when the inquisitors of Barcelona were accused of receiving bribes and suborning witnesses, an inquisitor of Valencia with the notary of Tortosa was dispatched thither, fully commissioned to investigate and report. End of Book 4, Chapter 2, Part 3 Read by Daryl Edson